Hi there, welcome to Where's the Money Gone, a podcast about football finance, governance and politics with me, Adrian Goldberg. I'm an investigative journalist and West Bromwich Albion season ticket holder. And I'm joined as always by Charlie Methven. Charlie is Charlton Athletics co-owner, former director of Sunderland, one-time advisor to Spurs and a boyhood Oxford United fan. This time, Ivan Tony's moved to Saudi. And what that tells us about the oil state's ambitions in sport. Welcome, Charlie. Before we talk about that, I've got to reflect on uh, a great weekend for West Bromwich Albion. We've made a number of signings in the transfer deadline, in the transfer window that have really excited supporters. We're unbeaten in four. Poor old Charlton Athletic. First defeat of the season at Reading. Yeah, well, good good morning, Adrian. Um, And uh, apologies for the... um slightly unusual setting of my car um, for various logistical reasons I won't go into. I'm um, just off the M4, um, but hopefully um, none the worse for it. Um, and uh, on the way back from um, Berkshire, where we were playing yesterday against Reading, um, to uh, South East London, where our, our women's team are playing a, a, a pre-season friendly stay against Villa. So it's a football weekend for me, um, obviously coming off the, the back end of the um, transfer window. Um, yeah, we lost our 100% record um, in the season um, yesterday. Um, it was a tight game, could have gone either way. Missed a couple of good chances when we were on top. Um, and then, um, of course, as often happens, um, the other team hits back. Um, but it was an exciting game, a tough game. And, and, you know, it was never realistic to think that we were going to win every game this season. Um, that, that was never going to happen in, in the rough and tumble of the EFL, as you know. But, yeah, good to see the baggies riding, riding the wave. Um, um, and, uh, and making such a cracking start to the season. And did you have a busy transfer deadline day? Um, no, <laughs> we did not. Um, we'd made a very significant number of signings in the early part of the transfer window, which I tend to think is generally the better way to do it, particularly in the EFL, where players like to get themselves settled before the start of the season. Um, and uh, we came to, to the end of the window in sort of opportunistic mode. If something really exceptional popped up that we that we or the manager felt would significantly improve us, then we'd have a look at it. But other than that, the nine signings which we'd made prior to that were, were deemed to be sufficient to see us through until um, in, in, until January. Obviously, you have to have a look at things in, in November, December and see what might be needed in January. Um, but overall, I think we are, um, touch wood at this point, reasonably content with both the window and the start of the season. OK, well, listen, let's talk about Ivan Tony's move then from Brentford to Al Ali in the Saudi Pro League for £40 million. Peterborough United, the England strikers' former club, will receive £4 million through a sell-on clause when he went to Brentford. And his personal contract is reported to be worth at least £50 million. And he'll line up at Al Ali alongside the former Leicester and Manchester City winger Riyad Mahrez, Bobby Firmino, once of Liverpool. Other ex other ex Premier League players in the Saudi Pro League include Alexander Mitrovic, Giorgio Wijnaldum, Ruben Neves, and Goli Kante. So, what are we to make of this? Before we discuss it in detail, Charlie, let let me just set out my stall about Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, I know, is a, a friend of the UK government and many jobs rely on it in this country through arms sales, but I see it as an autocratic, authoritarian state run by Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. He's been criticised by the likes of Amnesty International for his dire human rights record. He's been associated by the likes of the CIA in the killing of the journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Political dissidents are jailed without fair trial. There's capital punishment, including of people who are minors at the time of the alleged offence. Women don't have equal rights. Members of the LGBT community are viciously discriminated against. So I know it's this is a football podcast, but I just feel I have to say that because, for my money, we can't just see Saudi Arabia as just another country. Um, I mean, to be honest with you, Adrian, there's very little that you said there that I would disagree with. I think that I would divide um, the sort of the human rights stuff into two pieces, one of which is cultural to do with the dominant religion in in countries. Um, And obviously in Saudi, that's a a Muslim country. um, And religions have their own ethical codes. And um, generally speaking, um, I'm 
interested in and respectful of um, these differences. Um, you may or may not know that my uh, my university degree was was in theology, studied these things in in some depth, um, and perhaps take a sort of more um, nuanced view on religious difference than many observers in the UK might be inclined to do. That's part of it, and that would apply to many countries that have um, Muslim um, legal structures and, and culture and, and different. And then you've got the stuff which is much more particular to Saudi, which isn't necessarily a necessary in the necessary reflection of um, of Islam, but of, of Saudi's own uh, autocratic um, status itself. Um, there's, no, there's no necessity for a, a Muslim state to be an autocracy. There's no reason why it can't be a democracy. Um, and, uh, and those things which can, it can be particularly ugly in Saudi to do with the silencing of dissidents, to do with the way in which they treat other people who have differences to themselves um, is, 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 is ugly. Um, I, I don't find this an attractive country in, in, in these various different ways. Um, and certainly the way in which Saudi goes about utilizing its, its leverage with the given its position as a major oil producer, I also find unattractive. Um, and the UK's status as a friend of Saudi Arabia, I think that might be pushing it a bit. I think it's almost more like a sort of commercial partner in many ways, um, where both sides perceive that they get something out of not having an active enmity. Um, and that's probably, I think, probably about as far as it goes. There are other countries in the Middle East with which the UK has a much stronger relationship, <clears throat> Qatar, for instance, which, um, whilst it has its own human rights issues, as Amnesty would perceive it, certainly do not have anything like the same record of, um, you know, extrajudicial killings and, and all this type of stuff. I advised the Qataris for um, an, a, a significant number of years um, on public relations matters and watched them as they tried to edge towards a sort of form of governance which was a little bit more recognisable to those of us in the West. This isn't something that's happening in, in Saudi at all. Um, you know, the the, the sort of the, the, the nascent beginnings of democracy in Qatar, where there is a parliament which does decide on certain laws and all this other stuff, this really isn't a, a movement in, in Saudi. Um, what Mohammed bin Salman is doing, um, and whatever one might think of him, um, you know, from a moral perspective, there's no doubt that he is a highly energetic and effective leader of his nation, um, certainly from, his, from the royal family's perspective. Um, so what he's trying to do and his government's trying to do through sport is to try to take the eyes away from the bits that we find distasteful and focus on the things that bind us together, of which sport is, you know, is, is a major part. Um, so to that degree, I think the term sports washing is accurate, um, which is sport being used as a way of rather blunting the focus on um, the stuff which they would rather that we didn't um, sort of spend too much time thinking about. And as part of that, then, Ivan Tony has moved from Brentford to Al Ali, one of four clubs in the Saudi Premier League who are part owned by the Public Investment Fund. So this is the arm of government which seeks to invest the profits that Saudi Arabia makes from oil into other areas, including Newcastle United in the Premier League, of course. It invests that money so that Saudi Arabia as well as burnishing its image so that it also can have a, an economic future beyond fossil fuels. You know, the Saudis aren't stupid. They know that for all the prevarication of world governments, there will eventually be zero oil sold or very little oil sold in the world. I don't know how long it's going to take to get to that point, but we're clearly moving towards a, a decarbonised future. So we can see Ivan Tony's move in that context a little bit, but... Obviously, there's massive money. I mean, the figures I mentioned there are almost un unbelievable for the player himself, a truly life-changing sum. What's your sense of what he will find there in terms of a league? Because it, there's this image, isn't there, that Saudi Arabia tends to sign players like Cristiano Ronaldo, Ronaldo who have big names but are over the hill. Yes, well, I think we have to see the investment into football, um, and, and that comes in several different parts, as, um, as, as a part, a significant part of a much broader sports washing agenda, um, some of which appears to be working and some of which doesn't. Um, so if you look at their moves in boxing, where many of the most significant boxing bouts um, in the world
world are now staged in Saudi. And the traditional boxing promoters, you know, particularly our own um, Hearn family and Frank Warren and co are making vast amounts by taking their fighters to Saudi. That's working. And that's working because boxing is purely focused on the individuals concerned. Um, you know, really, I think most international sports viewers have a limited understanding of the differences between, you know, the WBC, the WBA, the IBF and all this type of stuff. All they know is that, you know, if there is a major world heavyweight title fight, they want to watch it. And whether that's being shown um, staged in Saudi or, um, or at Wembley or at Madison Square Gardens really has a relatively small impact on whether people are going to want to watch it or not. It's just a sort of time zone matters to deal with and, and all that type of stuff. So the boxing side of things seems like a quick, easy fit and it's worked and it's brought, you know, big, large numbers of people to Saudi to watch those fights. It's drummed up very significant TV viewing figures. Not entirely sure in terms of the business model, how exactly it works, but broadly speaking, that is, that is working. You then have their massive move into golf through Live Golf. Um, Again, golf has been a sport which is more focused on the individuals. You know, traditionally people would want to see Jack Nicholas and Arnold Palmer and um, Nick Faldo and, and Sandy Lyle. And now, of course, you know, other major golf names, um, some of which have moved to live golf and some of which have not. They've stayed with the US PGA Tour. So it's a sort of reasonably logical assumption to say, well, if we buy up some of the biggest names in golf, people are going to want to watch them. Um, that hasn't really proven to be the case. Um, it's proven that the US PGA Tour has a far stickier um, type of allure to it than necessarily just the names playing in it. And perhaps they've got a little bit unlucky in that we're in, a, in an era of golf where there aren't really any single massive names which would drag in, like Tiger Woods in his prime would have dragged people in that direction naturally. People would have wanted to see what Tiger was up to. But really, I'm looking at sort of the, the, the viewing figures for Live Golf, and, it, and it, it's a very meager return on investment compared to what might be hoped for as we're a couple of years in, and there's no real particular sign that that's changing massively. But nonetheless, they've made a, an impact, and there, are, there have been discussions with the US PGA about, um, about maybe a, a, some sort of merger, et cetera, which proves that there is an impact. There's stuff happening in golf, which they have disintermediated. And then you look at football. And football, from where I'm standing, just looking at the metrics, is, is just been a, a colossal failure. Um, and I know it's early days. I understand it. Yes, of course, things could change. But the numbers are so bad and so, um, if anything, headed in the wrong direction rather than the right direction. It just seems that in international markets, there is absolutely no appetite to watch Saudi club teams playing, no matter who is playing for them. And I think that makes sense when we think about how we all watch football, which is we're interested, obviously, in our own club, our historic club that we've followed, that we might, you know, fathers, parents, grandparents, friends, etc., have followed. And then we're also interested in the other historic clubs that we have followed and seen, you know, so you grew up being a West Brom fan, I grew up being an Oxford fan, but I'm still interested in the Manchester derby. I'm still interested in uh, the, the, the Classico of Madrid. I'm still interested in River Plate against Boca Juniors because these pictures have history, they have clout, and they have massive crowds um, and global followings. You are watching something which matters, which is going to go into the history books. And I just think, given that the focus on the clubs in football, which is massive, the clubs are easily the biggest brand names in football, unlike in boxing, it's just unbelievably difficult to persuade people that a match between two clubs that they've never heard of playing in a half-empty stadium, even if it's a fuller stadium, in a country that's never had any history of staging significant football matches, and where the ultimate outcome, which is who wins the Saudi Pro League, matters so little to anyone outside of Saudi and maybe other bits of the Middle East in part, it's just a, a, a colossal problem. And I'm not sure that Ivan solves that problem. He's a great player, arguably at the peak of his powers, as we saw during the, during the Euros. But if Ronaldo doesn't solve this problem, if Firmino doesn't solve this problem, why does Ivan Tony solve this problem? You know, I think Ivan's been playing for, Brian, for Brentford for the last few years, and I wouldn't necessarily say that there was a colossal number of people who were tuning in to watch Brentford games who weren't Brentford fans because Ivan was playing. Just not, not a big enough draw. Um, so the bet that's been made is that the younger generation are more fixated on the names, are more fixated on the players, and that they will then follow the players, hence the sort of the Ronaldo and, and, and sort of, you know, attempts on Messi and, and all these types of people. 
but it's not working. It's not happening. Now, if you look at the, the, the crowds are sclerotic. Um, for some of the clubs in Saudi, they're as low as 1,000, which is a roughly the same as a sort of sixth or seventh tier attendance in the UK. For some of the bigger clubs, um, it will be more like 20, 30,000 or whatever it might be, um, and, and, would have, and would have been so also before this massive investment into um, Saudi football. Saudi club football was already a popular product within Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is quite a big country, unlike most of the other countries in the Middle East, got a significant population. It's quite a football-loving nation. Um, so really then what you have to look at is if it's not going to have a massive impact on attendances within Saudi Arabia, what's it going to do for TV viewing figures? And when the Saudi Pro League made this huge investment, various international, um, you know, viewing platforms, media companies, you know, took up some rights to be able to screen their games, not for much or any money, really, but just sort of say, let's, let's suck it and see. And the viewing numbers have been absolutely catastrophic. They've been so bad that some of the platforms, most of the platforms who have these rights, don't even bother to exercise the rights. They are, you know, miles away from being at the level where they would even decide to put on the expense of, of, of screening these things. I saw an article only recently when um, there was a, a match, um, it was a Saudi Pro League match, and Canal Plus, um, which is the French channel, had, had, had the rights for that, but also for a French third division match. The French third division match collared more viewers than the Saudi Pro League matches. It's that extreme, you know, even leagues that the rest of the world would think of as being quite minor, of minor importance, are still massively more powerful when it comes to viewing numbers, even international viewing numbers, than the Saudi Pro League. So as a product, it just hasn't worked. So I think one of the things that people in the football industry have got some sort of degree of criticism about is they haven't really used their opportunity to, to, to change anything much. I think in Live, Live Golf, there's been an attempt to try and change things, make the tournaments a bit shorter, introduce various innovations, give mix, whatever it might be, um, no cut, so you make sure that the big players are still playing for the whole tournament and all this stuff and stuff. There, there's been some attempt at innovation. In the Saudi Pro League, it looks like they've gone for the cookie cutter. We want to be a league just like the European League. And a mixture of the lack of history, the lack of clout, the difficult time zones, the just general sort of torpor surrounding the whole thing, the small crowds have just led to a, 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 a real sort of, you know, flop effectively. Now, I'm sure there are people uh, who involved with the Saudi Pro League who would have all sorts of bits and bobs of metrics. They could say, well, we're getting more digital engagement. And I certainly can see um, in the in the MENA region, the Middle East and North Africa region, which is the region of the world which is mostly populated by people of Arab extraction, um, that the Saudi Pro League is the biggest game in town for that particular region. Um, but I would argue that that would have kind of happened anyway. Um, Saudi is the biggest country in that region. Saudi does have the biggest clubs in that region, mostly. Um, and therefore, you would sort of expect it gradually, the Saudi Pro League, to become the dominant regional player. But you sure as hell don't make the kind of expenditure that they've been making with the ambition of being viewed by more people in Egypt. I mean, that that's not... I imagine what the original intention was. They've got a further complicating factor with their reach within MENA, which is the, dominate, the, the dominant sports broadcaster in that part of the world is BN Sports, which is owned by the Qatari government, which has had its own challenges and problems with Saudi. Um, not just the Qatari government, but BN Sports itself has had challenges with and in Saudi. And I think that the Qataris are wary of giving too much promotion to a league which is controlled by their um, that their local geographical rivals. Vision 2030 is a plan created by Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince, the effective ruler of Saudi Arabia. It's a national plan which talks about creating a new Saudi Arabia, again, looking beyond the, the fossil fuel era, really. So it's about repositioning Saudi Arabia so that instead of simply saying, as I did in the introduction to this podcast, it's an oil state, that Saudi Arabia might be more than that, that it would be a country that would people would visit on holiday. It's a country that has big investments overseas. And we've seen, indeed, some of that in the northeast of England, in some cases before their involvement with Newcastle United, in some cases afterwards. Vision 2030 is a really bold vision to create, effectively, a, a new version of Saudi Arabia. Given that that is there, it's a political reality, and that Saudi Arabia appears to have almost unlimited money for investments 
like this. I just wonder if they'll stop anytime soon. I mean, there's no impetus for them to stop. If it's coming from MBS himself, and football is part of this broader repositioning of Saudi Arabia, yeah, the viewing figures may be pretty poor at the moment. But what what incentive do they have to stop when it kind of money means nothing really to them? Yeah, look, I, I think that's absolutely right. And I think there's also a power play internally for MBS. <clears throat> he wants to be able to reshape the country economically whilst remaining culturally very similar in terms of, you know, being an autocracy and, you know, with very limited rights for citizens and all this type of stuff. So the sports washing is not just for international reputation, it's also for local control as well. And the bet he's made is that if the younger generation have enough things to enjoy, whether it be, you know, going to the cinema, watching football, having better sort of beach facilities and all this type of stuff, that they'll basically let the um, the El Sal family carry on running the, the, the kingdom as, as the dictatorship, which it is. So I, I don't really see particularly any draw for him changing course on this. He can It helps him with his geographical reach in, in MENA. It helps him internally with, you know, what otherwise might be sort of the troublesome younger generation that's asking why they're living in such a restrictive place. Um, but the bit that's really relevant to us as a football industry is, is the impact that that has on on our industry, both in the UK and in Europe and in sort of the Western world, so to speak. Um, and I sort of, like a lot of people, was interested to see a year or two ago when they started this, whether that would be something that would have an impact, couldn't quite work out what it might be. And the answer is it really hasn't had an impact. And, the, you know, the, the, the likes of Ivan, Tony going to there, I think maybe if that were to happen with a lot of England national players, that might be problematic because effectively your national team players are going to play in a relatively uncompetitive league where they're not being subjected to the same pace of football that they might need to be to be kept up to speed to to really be competitive in an England shirt when they play in the, in, in the big championship. So that might be a bit of a challenge. I think it's also happening at a moment in time when spending controls are increasingly coming in to both the English game, but also the European game. So if you think about one of the reasons why Ivan Tony's moved to Saudi Arabia, obviously partially in his case for his own personal reward, but why Brentford accepted a £40 million bid? Well, the answer presumably is because there weren't any English clubs offering £40 million, um, you know, or, or more than £40 million. And that's got a lot to do with the spending rules that we've discussed ad infinitum on this podcast that I only see getting stricter as we go along. So the question I guess is, is as the spending controls get stricter and as the Saudi Arabian League keeps on going in this direction, do we start to see um, not just players who are coming towards, if not the end of their career, then into final big contract stage? I think, you know, Tony, is, is he 28? Something like that. You know, so he's coming towards that, right, I'm going to sign a four to five year contract that's going to, you know, set me and my entire family up for life and for the next two generations. Do we start to see um, younger players starting to be tempted over there because under the spending regulations, the Saudis that we have here, the Saudis are able to uh, sort of pay them double. And I did notice that there was a very bright young Brazilian player, 19-year-old, who went straight from Brazil straight into the Saudi Pro League. And that is a sort of new development. That starts to become something which structurally could make quite a difference. You know, let's say that, that the move that, let's say someone like Cole Palmer made from Man City to Chelsea as a really bright young player looking to make his way in the game. If some of the salaries that English clubs and other European clubs are able to offer are simply 50% that of what the Saudis are willing to offer, will we start eventually to see some development age and prime age players start to move across for purely financial reasons? And and what would that? What would the impact of that be on the national teams of, of all of our countries, etc.? Might that make that league more competitive? I'm not, as I said, not particularly convinced it's going to make it more televisually attractive for all the reasons rehearsed um, at the start of this pod. But it might start to have a sort of more structural impact in terms of um, European football, the Champions League, the quality in the Champions League, etc. But I'm sure the ultimate dream is for them to be able to qualify clubs from there into the Champions League, etc. Um, and at the moment, that door will be very firmly shut for obvious reasons. But I did notice the other day that the PIF made a very significant investment into CONCACAF, um, and which is the um, the FIFA region encompassing the Caribbean, Central America, North America, etc. And it's historically not been one of the wealthier 
um, you know, regions of the football world because they don't have many big clubs, etc. So I think probably you, you may well start to see more teams from Saudi starting to maybe be able to enter some of those competitions that CONCACAF runs and starting to see them competing as MLS clubs and this club of stuff. So the impact of all that is somewhat unpredictable. But I still stand by my original point in terms of structural viewership. I, I'm, I'm just not sensing and smelling the likelihood of traditional football markets starting to really follow Saudi teams. No, there is another way in which Saudi Arabia can interact with world football, though, isn't there, which is by hosting major tournaments. So in 2023, we had the World Club Championship staged in Saudi Arabia. Manchester City won that. They are, as far as I'm aware, the only country seeking to host the 2034 World Cup, and they've outlined plans for, I think, 11 new stadiums. So again, that's another way, isn't it, through which Saudi Arabia can exercise its power, use football as a as an advertising billboard for its brand, really, and to which football seems, certainly at that international level, at that FIFA level, seems only too complicit, only too willing to accept the money. Yeah, and I, and I think that, is, that, that those are very sensible moves. You know, there's no doubt that holding these tournaments drives drives tourism industry and not the short term but medium term and whilst i haven't recently been to saudi arabia i'm told that the tourism facilities are being upgraded very very dramatically um, and it is starting to become a viable destination for not just sort of adventure travelers but also uh, or not just pilgrimage travelers but also more general tourism um, and holding holding the world cup and giving that showcase of what the country actually looks like to um, a global audience, I think it would be a, a sensible investment in a country that's trying to develop other industries other than oil to sustain it beyond oil, as you said in the first place. So holding the World Cup, I, I, it's going to happen, I think. Um, and I think it'll probably work for them well, um, as I think it has done for Qatar. Um, and a lot of money from that will obviously flow into FIFA. What FIFA does over that would be interesting. But, you know, we, we live in hope that it will be distributed in an interesting way to the football universe. Um, but uh, that's not quite the same as saying that the Saudi Pro League itself is going to work in the meantime, because you've effectively got a 10-year runway between now and that World Cup. And I imagine that the vision is is that um, the Pro League would have become a big success by then, um, that obviously Newcastle would have got to the top table of European football, uh, you know, by then in terms of, you know, winning, winning the Premier League, maybe sort of, you know, met, winning the Champions League, whatever it might be. And the sort of combination of all these things together will enable Saudi to almost announce itself as a major player on the football, sort of the permanent major player on the football world stage. Because let's not kid ourselves that holding a World Cup makes you a player on the world stage. Qatar hosted a World Cup. It is not a player on football's world stage. And I would say that as somebody who was an advisor to them at the time. It's a, it was a useful exercise in tourism promotion and in brand promotion um, etc. But I don't think it, it means that now, two or three years in, the global spectators are tuning in to watch the Qatari League or anything like that. Um, so the, for all this thing to come together into Vision 2030, um, you know, it, it's probably a bit like throwing, um, throwing mud against the wall. Some of it will stick, some of it won't. Um, hosting the World Cup will stick. Um, hosting major world title boxing fights will stick. Live golf, let's wait and see hasn't stuck so far, but there may be something there. Saudi Pro League looks to me to be one of those things which will have to be, you know, uh, pursued um, probably more out of ego and pride rather than because it's actually pr producing a genuine return on investment. Yeah, and one of the potential barrier as well to top players going over there, certainly European players or players of European extraction. You mentioned right at the top that, of course, <clears throat> Saudi Arabia is, of course, a Muslim country. But as with Christianity, as with Judaism, as with many of the great religions of the world, Islam comes in many different forms, doesn't it? But there is a, a very particular conservative form of Sunni Islam practised in Saudi Arabia. And that does mean that people who go and live in Saudi Arabia who are not used to that culture might find it very restrictive. And although there may have been some 
easing at the edges of those societal restrictions, I would have thought that for many young Europeans there and their families going over to live in Saudi Arabia for any length of time, notwithstanding the money, would be quite a big culture shock. And I'm I'm saying that even out with the political element of this and with all due respect to the fact that people do around the world have different cultural expectations and perspectives but i think if you take your average 21 year old from west bromwich to put them and potentially their family down in in riyadh would impose restrictions that that they may well bristle against well i think footballers uh, professional footballers lead, lead quite aesthetic um existences mostly these days um that you know that that I wouldn't, it, it's not like the old days when they're all partying down the pub after the game and sort of, you know, going out to nightclubs on a Saturday night. That's largely sort of disappeared from the upper echelons of our game anyway. Um, so I think we're, we're in a place probably where lifestyle-wise, you know, they'll have their own personal chef, they'll have a lovely villa, which is obviously sunny most of the year. Probably in, in some of the cases of, of some people out there who I know involved in the football industry out there, they'll have a place which is quite close to the straight leading to Bahrain. Um, which means that they can pop across to Bahrain for a couple of days where it is a more relaxed um, regime. You know, you can have a few beers and sort of go to a sort of, you know, your, your wife can wear a skirt out to the restaurant and all that type of stuff. But in the meantime, they're living on compounds, um, luxury compounds um, in Saudi, sort of, you know, gold-plated uh, everything uh, with, a, with, a, with a bit more latitude allowed within those compounds than would be the case in the rest of the country. So I think, Given the particularities, the peculiarities of a professional footballer's existence being quite outside of training, quite sort of restrictive and dull anyway, um, I, I, I kind of think that's not going to be maybe the problem that some people thought it might be. I think playing consistently in extreme heat, I've heard, is, 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 a, is a challenge and something that they're not all that keen on, um, some of the footballers who have gone over there. Um, and, you know, that... That, that can be underestimated. You know, if you're, if you're of a cultural type and a skin type and a sort of, you know, just a, a genome type where extreme heat does not necessarily particularly agree with you, then in Saudi, that is going to, that is going to be a big challenge and likewise for your family. Um, but I think the sums of money involved are probably enough to pour balm on any of those, um, those types of wounds. Finally, and briefly, Charlie, from what you say then, given the, lack of take-up globally of the Saudi Pro League. It doesn't sound as though, at the moment anyway, you're expecting a mass exodus of top players from the Premier League. It's not going to massively damage English football in the short term or European football. Personally, for Ivan Tony, does this mean that he has lost his England place? And if England lost Ivan Tony, a player who many people thought was a striker even at his relatively late age who had potential to go on and be a, a good striker for the national team? Well, I, I, mean, I, I don't really know. I, I mean, the, the England have not lost Ivan Tony. You know, there's still international breaks. There are still opportunities for the England manager to select Ivan Tony. The question will just be, and I guess, you know, th this will have to be tested, won't it? Because it hasn't really, the, the situation has not arisen yet because Jordan Henderson went there just pretty much at the end of his England career. It probably did spell the end of his career. He wasn't, you know, going to keep on getting selected at his age. But Ivan's several years younger than, um, uh, than than Jordan was at the time. And I think given he's three or four years younger than Harry Kane, probably the expectation was that he would be part of the succession plan for Harry Kane in terms of being a viable international level target man. Um, so it'll be a really interesting question for Lee Carsley, the England manager, to address to see, well, does playing at a lower level of football um, with, with a less intense level than the Premier League and the Champions League operate at, does that have an impact on a player's ability to turn out and play really well for the national team? That will have to be tested, I guess, and, and, and let's, let's wait and see. But probably there will be other players looking at Ivan Tony's situation and, and, and inspecting that bit of it quite carefully and closely because while there are some players who are solely financially motivated the majority of professional footballers who I've met their life dream is to play for England and if there is any suggestion as happens in rugby that by moving overseas or particularly moving overseas to this type of jurisdiction that you're basically going to end your England career I think that would be a, a, a big challenge so it'd be really interesting to see how the Football Association and Lee Carsley um, the, the, the interim England ma manager treat 
this situation? You know, do, do they say, well, let's give it a go, let's suck and see, or do they simply say, do you know what, he's chosen to go over there, that's not a level of football we really recognise, um, we're, we're going to move on and start, you know, looking at players who are playing at a better level of football. Because it wasn't like he was a dead cert choice anyway, they're not being landed with a situation where Jude Bellingham has gone to Saudi or something like that. It's, it's, he was always going to be a 50-50 call, so it'd be interesting to see what happens. Great to speak to you as always. Charlie, thank you very much indeed for joining us from your car on the M4. Much appreciated. And uh, before we go, just to remind you that you can read more of the book I'm trying to write called Where's the Money Gone? I've just had another extension to my deadline. Head over to adriangoldberg.substack.com. This has been a We Bring Audio production by me and by Jed Thomas. And we are very grateful to Mark Machado and 11.29 for providing the socials on these episodes as well. So thanks to Charlie. We'll be back next week, notwithstanding the international break. So uh, if you enjoy this episode, please tell your friends and leave us a positive review. We'll see you again soon. Cheers now. Bye-bye.